Konnichiwa, my name is Biscuit, and today we are going to continue the Polygon Renderer project. I'm going to show you an intuitive method of creating a software the ready renderer that can be used for simple games. In the last episode I demonstrated triangle rendering with smooth colors. Instead of a triangle mesh, I will just create a simple rectangle that is composed of two triangles. Each triangle has three corners, and each corner has four props, the screen X and Y coordinates, and the texture U and V coordinates. Then I will create a simple but cool looking texture for demonstration purposes. Credits for this formula goes to Uneven Prankster. He provided the background pattern for it, and I made some minor additions. The actual texture drawing function does not need to be changed at all. It will happily interpolate the U and V coordinates just as well as it did previously with the color channels. But for safety reasons, I add an if statement in the pixel plotting function to verify that the X and Y coordinates are within visible screen range. This is the outcome. Just that easily, we have a textured rectangle. This rectangle can be resized horizontally or vertically. It can also be rotated freely. We can also freely resize and stretch it. However, watch what happens if we pick one corner and move it. The interior of the triangle becomes sort of wonky. Half of the quadrilateral is shaped one way, and the other half is shaped some other way. From the source code it is obvious why this happens, but is this really correct, or is there something we are missing? Let's make an actual three-dimensional scene to test this stuff in more detail. The process of making a fully rotatable and adjustable 3D engine begins with creating a small vector mathematics library. In my programming videos I usually strive hard to make the design as compact as possible. My general preference is compact expressions that achieve a lot instead of long and verbose code that does not achieve much. That's because this is a video. As a viewer, you are not able to scroll my code. You are at the whim of whatever I decide to keep visible on the screen, so I always always try to make sure that everything relevant fits in one screenful, if at all possible. The same goes here. For my vector mathematics library, I designed just a handful of functions that will hopefully achieve everything I need from this program. The first function sum calculates the sum of elements in the input object. The input object can be anything where both std-get and std-tuple size are valid. These are the std-array, the std-tuple, and the std-pair. These three objects are possible representations of vectors in my program. I will call them vectors from now on. The second function mul is a Swiss army knife, but essentially it applies any binary operator between two vectors or between a vector and a scalar. By default the function calculates the product of the two objects, but you can make it calculate some sort of differences by supplying a different function object as a template parameter. The three other functions are the dot product, the length, and the vector normalization. Now using the mul function by itself would produce some rather unsightly code. To simplify some usage of my vector math library, I added some operators for basic arithmetic. You know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. To make sure that the compiler won't try and fail to use these operators with non-vector types, I use the requires clause to restrict these operators to only apply with pairs of vectors or with a vector and a scalar. This concept requires thing is new in C20. For the most part in my video I use it just as a spice to help catch programming errors, but here it actually has a functional role. It restricts the overload to match certain types only. If your present moment is far enough in the future, you can find a video I made explaining C20 concepts by clicking the card that pops up about now. Now we get to the main program. Here I will reuse much of the code that I wrote for the 75,000 subscribers demo. It is not part of the lesson, but just something I need to write in order to make things happen. The add cuboid function in particular is pretty much the epitome of write-only code. But that doesn't have to mean the code is not reusable. This is me reusing that code. The function creates a triangle mesh for a cuboid with eight props for each vertex. Three dummy values, followed by the XYZ coordinates, followed by the UV texture coordinates. Each triangle is therefore denoted by 24 float values in the vector called try. This part here deals with forward and reverse perspective projection. 
The formula are explained in the source code comments, but they will be discussed in detail several times later in the video. To keep the scope clean of any temporary variables, I used the lambda generator function to hide the temps, leaving only the two functions in the main function's scope. Figuring out how to indent this kind of code turned out to be surprisingly difficult. I am not completely happy with it, but ugh. The code also should have way more blank lines, but as I explained earlier, I try to keep as much context on the screen as possible. Instead of blank lines, I used the red comments as visual separators between elements. Next is the input handling, which provides rotation and movement backwards and forwards along all three axes. Now just a word about mathematics. This tutorial is about texture mapping and polygon rendering. These are topics that you are very, very unlikely to learn in school, and even with the knowledge that you do learn in school, it is quite difficult to come up with the missing pieces. However, any high school will teach you vector math. Later, maybe in a university, I don't know, never been there, they will also teach you matrix math. Someday I might make a video about vector or matrix mathematics, but that's not what this video is for. Then there is the whole quaternion stuff. Here's the thing, I have looked it all up. I have literally copy-pasted formulas from Wikipedia and other sites I have found, and I have tinkered with the stuff for hours until I got everything working. Then I deleted everything that is not needed, and spent a great deal of time making the rest as compact as possible. I do know the textbook definitions i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals ijk equals minus one and so on, because I have read about it on Wikipedia, but I don't understand quaternions well enough to teach about it. If I tried, anyone who actually knows something would laugh at my misunderstandings, and for a teacher that's not a great idea. If you don't know any of that stuff, or you have forgotten, or you just need a quick reference, you can look it up. I have put links to online articles in the video description and in the pinned comment in case you want to read up. And it is done! Notice that I didn't change the draw polygon function at all. All of the changes were in the main function. We now have a 3D scene in which I can move around freely. At the first glance everything looks fine, especially the wall in the back that is directly facing us. However, notice how those walls behave that are at an oblique angle towards us. When I move the camera around, the texture appears as if it is warping, moving along with the camera. The more the shape of the wall differs from an equilateral, the more pronounced the effect comes. This is because we are not doing perspective correction in our texture mapping. We are only doing affine mapping without regard for perspective. Herein lies the crux of the problem. In rectilinear perspective projection, which is a powerful approximation on how the brain comprehends shapes, as objects move farther away from the viewer, they become smaller. Not only that, but the details of the objects become smaller too. In a rectilinear perspective projection, the two-dimensional screen coordinates are created by dividing the three-dimensional x and y coordinates by the three-dimensional z coordinate. There are also some constants involved, but let's not focus on those right now. This division is the magic that makes the perspective happen. As the z-coordinate, that is distance from viewer, increases, the details diminish in size, because they are divided by a larger number. Dividing by a larger number means the result is smaller. Right now, in our texture mapping code, although we are properly projecting the geometry of our polygons, that is, the far side of the wall appears smaller than the near side of the wall, the details in the walls are placed at equidistant intervals because of the linear interpolation that we are doing. The details should be sparse in the front and dense in the distance. Somehow we have to account for the z-coordinate in the interpolation. The solution involves three particular changes. First, instead of iterating through the z-coordinate verbatim, we iterate through the inverted z-coordinate. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention you have to include a z for each corner? You have to include a z for each corner, just like we did with the color in the first episode when we did go-out shading. Look, here's the code. 
Here we take the XYZ coordinate from the corner of the polygon in the world. Then we subtract the player's position from it, so that we can pretend the player is in the center of the world. This produces a vector called XYZ of whatever type. Then we multiply the XYZ vector with the rotation matrix. This rotates the world so that everything that is in front of the player has a positive Z coordinate and everything else has a negative Z coordinate. The result is an array called R. Then we produce two-dimensional screen coordinates Vx and Vy by applying perspective projection to the array. You know perspective projection. This thing. The points that are sent to the renderer contain six items. The 2D coordinates, the Z coordinate, which was calculated here, remember, and the texture coordinates, which also come from the world polygon information, just like the 3D coordinates did. We can't use this Z coordinate, by the way, because that's before the projection and translation. So these are the six props that are put in the tuple, and three sets of those are given to the draw polygon function. Include the three-dimensional Z coordinate with each corner from before you applied the perspective projection, but after you did the rotation and translation. But you have to interpolate the inverted Z coordinate, not the Z coordinate itself. Secondly, instead of iterating through the texture coordinates verbatim, we multiply the start and end values by the inverted Z coordinates in both ends. Note that this change is not done for the X coordinate. The X coordinate is still iterated just like before. Finally, to retrieve the texture coordinate for any particular pixel, divide the Z inverted texture coordinate by the inverted Z coordinate, and there you have your value. Of course, just like before, you can use this same process for any arbitrary props that you want to calculate for each pixel. In the GLSL, these are called varying variables, and you can have an arbitrary number of them. This division here must be performed once for every rendered pixel. In the past, this was a big deal and a huge problem for software rendering, because divisions are slower to calculate than any other basic arithmetic operation. Games such as Quake often employed clever measures to avoid having to perform the division on every pixel, sacrificing some of the image quality for speed, hoping the player will not notice it. Even the infamous Doom had to account for it. They solved the issue by having all walls strictly vertical, so that the division only has to be performed once per column, not once per pixel. And it's time to do exactly that in the source code. Not the sacrificing of image quality for speed, but implement the stuff that I talked about. Invert the starting and ending Z coordinates, multiply the starting and ending values for each prop with that inverted value, and uninvert the inverted Z coordinate on each pixel and multiply the interpolated values with that value to get the perspective corrected prop. Now when we look at the object at any angle, the walls are rendered properly. Textures are no longer behaving wonky. But that brings me to another topic. Watch what happens if I go to this side of the cube. Whoa! What was that? Sometimes walls are rendered atop each other's. Sometimes walls disappear entirely. And if I go behind the box and look straight on, the vision is outright trippy. As I explained in my Doom Style 3D Engine video, there are multiple ways to solve this problem. By far the easiest solution is to use a Z buffer. A Z buffer is an array of Z coordinates. It is also called a depth map. It records for each pixel the Z coordinate of the closest pixel drawn so far. When a new pixel is being drawn, the code will look at the array and check if the current Z coordinate is closer than whatever is recorded in the array. If the coordinate is closer, the pixel is drawn and the new Z coordinate is saved in the array. Otherwise, the pixel is discarded. And just like that, Four lines of code later we can test again, and this time the cube is rendered without problems from all possible angles. Hmm, speaking of angles, look at the corners for a moment. Don't they look awfully pixelated to you? Granted I deliberately chose a low resolution for this video in order to demonstrate certain things, but when we go very close to the texture we can see some really sharp pixel transitions. For example, this disk here. The edge of this disk should be completely smooth, but when we look at it closely, instead of a smooth gradient, we see very large pixels. 
everywhere around the cube the details are quite pixelated in fact. Is there nothing we can do about this? Well of course there is, and it is rather easy in fact. It is called anti-aliasing, or to say more accurately, bilinear filtering. But before we do actual bilinear filtering, I will demonstrate a cool way to approximate bilinear filtering. It is very quick to implement and has minimal impact to the rendering speed. It involves dithering and requires adding an array declaration and just two lines of code. This is called ordered dithering, and how well it works is truly remarkable. If we fly close to the corner, we can no longer see sharp edges between texels. If we look at the disk, it is now similarly very smooth. Of course there are some dithering artifacts now, but if you watch this video in 160p, you totally cannot even notice them. Ok, I just wanted quickly to show that. You can often apply ordered dithering in surprising ways. Let's do proper bilinear filtering now. To do that, we need a method to decompose a pixel color to its constituent parts, the red, the green and the blue. And we need the method to compose those parts back into a color. Then we need a method to mix two colors at varying proportions. This is actually just the interpolation formula that has already become the central star of our video series. The actual bilinear filtering begins by sampling four texels from the texture. The current coordinate, the one on its right side, the one directly below it, and the one that is below and to the right. The top two texels are decomposed and mixed in proportion by the fractional part of the current V coordinate, and the same is done to the bottom two texels. Then the resulting two mixtures are mixed in proportion by the fractional part of the current U coordinate. The resulting mixture is then recomposed into a color, and this color is drawn on the screen. Now, if we have a new look at the rendering, the colors are very smooth indeed. There is still some jaggedness on the right side, and this is because I mistakenly did the linear interpolation after the X coordinate was already rounded to an integer. It is easy to fix this, but I did realize this too late in my video production, so the fix is provided in the pinned comment rather than on the screen. For the most part, this looks just perfect. So far we have concentrated entirely on triangles. I admit there are sometimes situations where it is easier to work with more arbitrary polygons. For example, here is a computer screen. In the screen there is a video game going on. Within the game there is this flat surface. This flat surface is likely constructed from just two triangles. But notice that the part of the surface is obscured by a ledge. This part is not visible. Should we render it? Maybe, maybe not. If it is possible to do with reasonable effort, you should avoid rendering stuff that will not be visible on the screen. So let's cut it out. But now the surface is no longer a triangle. It became a quadrilateral. Quadri meaning it has four. Lateral meaning sideways or sides. Having four sides. To make it into triangles again, we need to split it into triangles like this for example. But because we had to do this split on runtime, what was the benefit of making the scene from triangles in the first place? What if we just change our system to render any convex polygons, such as this pentagon? Turns out we can do that. Sort of. To begin with, let's do away with triangles and construct our sample scene from quads instead. That is, four corner polygons instead of three corner polygons. This actually ends up simplifying our code in some parts. The draw polygon function needs some changes. Instead of passing three corner points to it, we change it so that you can pass to it range of any number of points. Between draw polygon and rasterize triangle we will add an extra function called tessellate triangle, which tessellates the polygon. Tessellate means to divide into triangles. There are multiple algorithms to do tessellation. Here is my algorithm for it. I won't spare too much exposition over how my algorithm works, other than that it tries to maximize the average length of horizontal lines in the resulting triangles, for slightly better performance compared to a naive algorithm. It's not exact science, this is totally experimental. Nonetheless, it works just fine. There is nothing too exciting about this demonstration, it looks just the same as be. Uh oh, what was that? 
if we move too close to the surfaces, we get the uh, exciting graphical performance art. Multicolored pixels and mind-boggling shapes extending to the infinity. This bug has of course existed all the time. It's not exactly a bug, just a shortcoming. It is what happens when the surface, or part thereof, extends behind the camera. The solution to this is called clipping. In the Doom style 3D engine video I showed you a way to deal with this problem. Many people then posted confused comments on my video asking me to explain the magic numbers. It is time that I show you how to deal with it properly. First, let's define a geometric construct called plane. A plane is an infinite flat surface that is facing some direction at some location. It divides space into two sections, things that are on one side of the plane and things that are not on that side of the plane. All flat surfaces, including polygons, can be defined as planes. However, contrary to polygons, a plane has no edges. It is infinite. My plane constructor creates a plane from three arbitrary points in space. It then calculates two variables, a normal vector and a distance scalar, that define the plane. For any point that is on the plane, a dot product between the normal vector and the point will equal the distance. You can read more about the plane in Wikipedia. I kinda went to town with the design of this constructor. It's really quite simple, the mathematics it does is explained in the single comment inside the function, but the implementation is a bit crazy. All in the name of giving the compiler maximal opportunities for simd optimizations, or so I would like to believe. The requires clause is new in C++20, I just use it as a code quality thing, much like the const keyword. In this case, you can safely remove it without changing the code behavior in any manner. Next I will create something called a frustum, which is a collection of clipping planes. Here we have a screenshot, or concept art, of Shadow of Tomb Raider. It is not the player character, I think, but that is beside the point. The character is looking forward. If we draw a rectangle representing their field of vision, it would look something like this. The view is rectangular because the computer screen is rectangular and it is located somewhere in front of the player. The distance is irrelevant. It could be tiny and directly in front of them, or huge and in the distance. What matters are the sides. The vision forms sort of a pyramid with four sides. One of these sides is highlighted here. This triangle forms a plane. Towards the right side of the plane, the player can see everything, and towards the left side of the plane, the character can see nothing. The same goes for the top, the right, and the bottom. In 3D graphics, these planes are called clipping planes, and you need as many of them as there are edges to your viewport. The tip of this pyramid is in the origo, which is the player's eye position. The other corners of this pyramid can be calculated by reversing the perspective projection for each of the screen corners. In other words, since you can get 2D screen coordinates using a formula that involves division by Z, multiplication and addition, if you know the Z coordinate, you can solve the three-dimensional X and Y coordinates from the screen coordinates. And for the purposes of the clipping plane, you can choose any arbitrary Z coordinate. These constants, by the way, are calculated like this. This is how you account for the field of vision, the display aspect ratio, and the screen resolution. Now besides these four clipping planes, you need one more plane. This plane is right in front of the origo and is called a near-clipping plane. The near-clipping plane will remove anything that is behind the player. It also clips polygons that are partially behind the player. Technically it should be at the player's eye position, but in practice it is placed some distance ahead to prevent infinite numbers from being generated when the object is very close to the player. Some games also employ a far clipping plane, but we don't actually need that. In any case, frustum is what the shape is called that you get from the combination of these clipping planes. It usually has four sides and the caps, but it may have any number of sides from three upwards. In this function, I first created the near clipping plane. Then in a loop we go through all consecutive pairs of corners of the screen and create a side clipping plane for each edge by creating a triangle between those two corners and the origo and converting that triangle into a plane.
Next, I will split the polygon generator into two parts. The first part is applying whatever rotations and translations are necessary to transform the world so that it is around the player. The second part is applying the perspective projection. In between of these, we add some filtering steps. If we wanted to do backface culling, this would be the right place to put it. I'm not doing that, but what I am going to do is to clip the polygon against the clipping planes. For that we need to add a function. Once again we go through all pairs between successive points. For all points, we test which side of the plane the point is. If the line segment formed by these two successive points crosses the clipping plane, we need to calculate where it crosses and use linear interpolation, there it is again, to calculate the new point. Points that are outside the frustum are deleted. However, because I am changing the list of points in place rather than copying them into a new vector, I need to postpone the deletion of the first point until the entire loop has been processed. Finally, because we are now doing proper clipping, we can delete the range checks in the pixel drawing function, making it faster. And now we can move through walls and go inside the box and look at any angle and nothing does not not fail to work. Now this is just a starting point, one of the many possible starting points towards making a 3D game. I am planning to make more videos on this topic, and in fact most of this stuff I already designed 5 years ago, but because of my day job and other commitments, and because inspiration does not come as commanded, especially when one's mind is prone to depression, it has taken this long to actually make this first part into a video. If you subscribe to my channel and stay subscribed, you will be among the first ones to know when I upload more. Sometimes I publish progress updates on my community tab and it will only appear on your YouTube front page if you subscribe. Consider also becoming my patron on patreon.com. I post the release candidate versions of this video on Patreon and on the patron-only Discord channel weeks before the video was published. I don't always do that, but if you become a patron, you may get access to previews of my upcoming videos long before the rest of the world does, and you get to offer feedback that can change the video before it is published. I am working towards enabling the same for my YouTube channel members. Have a nice and safe day, Haksameach, and be well.